Hi, in our next ed puzzle, we're going to look at the erythrocytes. Now remember, erythrocytes are red blood cells. And the topics we're going to cover in this lecture will be the structure of the red blood cell. We'll be talking about hematocrit and hemoglobin. We will also look at how red blood cells are formed. And then we're going to talk about how they're destroyed. So as far as the structure of a red blood cell goes, again, erythrocytes, and just so you know, a lot of anatomy is actually named um, using Latin or Greek root words and prefixes. So if you break down this word erythrocyte, you probably recognize site means cell, mature cell, and erythro is actually Greek for the color red. So these are the most numerous of all the formed elements. Remember when we looked at that centrifuge blood, there was a big column of the red cells. Now, one cubic millimeter, which is the same as a microliter of blood, has about 5 million red blood cells in it. That's a lot of cells, so they're very, very numerous. Whenever you look at a slide of blood, you will see the red cells everywhere. And one of the tools or units that we use to measure them is called hematocrit. So hematocrit measures, it's actually the percent of the red blood cells in a sample. We'll be looking at that shortly. And what you're seeing here is a capillary. And capillaries, you might remember, are the smallest of the blood vessels. And notice these little red blood cells, how they actually can like twist and bend as they move through these capillaries because they're going to have a specialized structure. All red blood cells are A and nucleate. A in front of the word means, <clears throat> excuse me, without. So you'll see the little white space inside. That's where the nucleus used to be. Well, they don't have a nucleus, so they don't have DNA right inside of them. Um, they only live for three to four months because they can't replicate. Right? If your cell's going to replicate, you have to replicate all the DNA first and all the organelles. And in fact, they don't really have any organelles. The mitochondria are there at the very beginning and they're ejected. The nucleus pops out before it's released. And so they're basically just a bag of hemoglobin. Now, if I ask you where are the red blood cells formed, you actually learned this in AMP2. Do you remember where they're made? Hopefully you said the bones, right? They are made in red bone marrow, and that's the source of all of our red blood cells. So they're made. They live three to four months. They live longer in males, closer to four months in males, like 120 days, maybe three months in females, around 90 days. Part of that's due to testosterone. And they're basically just a little sack of hemoglobin. And they're called red blood cells. And you'll see in a moment that this hemoglobin has a red pigment called heme. Now, the shape is important. If you look at their shape, I showed you earlier how they can kind of bend. I like to think of them like a soft contact disc, how they're flexible. They have a really high surface to volume ratio. So what that means is that for their size, they're tiny, but they can absorb and release a lot of oxygen. I'll be giving you some numbers soon. And because of their shape, they also can kind of line up next to each other, this thing called Rolo, and that's what you see in this picture, how they kind of like line up and can pass through as a unit as they go through the capillaries, and they're very, very flexible. Now, you don't have to memorize these sizes here, but notice that often the red blood cell is actually bigger than the capillary it has to go through. So I mentioned hematocrit, and hematocrit is how we tend to measure how many red cells we have. So, you know, if I ask you what's the function of your red blood cells, you are probably telling me something to do with oxygen, right? Well, red blood cells carry a lot of oxygen. They also carry some CO2. So you do want to know about your red count, right? We want to make sure that we have plenty of red cells. So what you do is you take blood, and you spin it down in a centrifuge, and then remember it separates it out, so you can see here the plasma and the red blood cell column, really easy to see because you see the red, and then you can see that little buffy layer there. Remember that buffy layer had the leukocytes and the platelets. And so we spin it down and we look at normal. It's usually, you know, males are higher, again, due to testosterone. It raises the red count. But males will be closer to 42 to 50% of that sample, whereas females are going to be a little bit lower. And so all they do is if you look at your total sample here, you just look at where that red count, the column ends. And then it's what percent of the total is the red cells. That's all it is. So in this one, you can see the red cells are much lower. And in this picture, you can see that that red cell column is higher.
So our hematocrit increases with dehydration. So when we're dehydrated, there's less water in our blood. And remember that most of that water is up there in the plasma. So look at the plasma column here. See how, the, notice how the plasma actually is less here. Um, so our plasma actually is going to shrink. And typically what happens is your red cell might just read elevated because you don't have as much plasma. So if I try to draw it here, drawing two test tubes, that's a pretty bad picture. And let's do red. So we have two blood samples and this will be a normal person, normal volemic, right? They're not dehydrated. And so what we're gonna see here is that the column, let's just do this. Let's draw the plasma here, okay? So that's normal. We have about 55% plasma, 45% red cell. Now, if someone's dehydrated, let's look at this. They're going to have, let's keep the same amount of red cells. So I'm gonna try to keep this the same. Okay, so in this example, I'm not measuring it, but it's roughly 45, 50%, right, of the total. This sample, same red cells, but now I'm dehydrated, so now this is my plasma. I didn't change the red cells, did I? But notice now that they're, the hematocrit went up. And again, this is pretty extreme. This is probably like 80%. It would never be that high. I'm just trying to make a point here. So sometimes just when we're dehydrated, we read a high hematocrit. So if you go drink water and get hydrated again, your hematocrit is normal. So that's one of the main causes of an increased hematocrit you would wanna see if your patient was dehydrated. Okay, if it's too low, we're going to worry, right? We don't have those red cells. So why would you have less red cells? Well, one, you're bleeding. Right, if, if you have blood loss, hemorrhage, any bleeding, it can be an obvious one, you know, like you see the bleed, or there can be internal. You can have GI bleeds that would result in blood in feces. You could have um, internal bleeding from trauma, right? And you would see bruising. Um, so any kind of blood loss would lower it. Maybe you're not bleeding, but there's a problem with making them. So we said they're made in the red bone marrow, but maybe they're not being produced. Remember, they only live three to four months. So you're making them, but they're dying and you're not keeping up with the demand, so it's going to fall. Or maybe there's no issues with the formation or bleeding, but something's attacking them and they're lysing, they're dying too early. And so they're dying too quickly and you can't replace them as quickly. And we'll be looking at these soon. And when we look at a low hematocrit, I know you've heard of the term anemia, and that's kind of like a generic word we use. There's different forms of anemia, but it's when our, our red count is too low. So if we look at these red blood cells, we also said that the red blood cell is basically um, a bag of hemoglobin, right? And they're actually cells. So we talked about blood being more viscous than water, but what really determines the viscosity is the amount of water in your blood. So when you're dehydrated, your blood is thicker. And if you're very, very hydrated, it's thinner. However, it's also a factor of your hematocrit. And what you can see here is normal levels, and here's the hematocrit right around here, you know, roughly 40, 45, um, and you can see the viscosity. Well, notice that as you increase your red cells, that the viscosity goes up. And so what happens is as our hematocrit increases, which is what you see as the number goes up, notice that the blood becomes more viscous. So that is a concern if, um, and we'll talk about this with blood doping, but if there's too many red cells, the blood becomes thicker, and then it's more difficult for it to flow through the capillaries and the smaller vessels of the body. So back to this hemoglobin, if we look at a red blood cell, again, lots of hemoglobin, does not have the usual organelles, does not have the mitochondria. So remember, it can only do glycolysis. And if you remember from a &P one with glycolysis, you can only use glucose for energy. So one reason why we have to maintain our blood glucose levels is our red blood cells need it, right? They're constantly working, they never get a break. So if we look inside a red blood cell, it has hemoglobin. Now, you do not need to know this number, but they say that it has one red blood cell, has 250 million hemoglobins. 
It's crazy, right? Remember that a cubic millimeter of blood, one microliter of blood has 5 million red blood cells, and each red blood cell is going to have these um, hemoglobin molecules. So what is hemoglobin? Well, you'll notice the word heme and globin. So globin is the protein chain. In this picture, it's the brown and the tan. So it's a quaternary protein. You don't have to memorize that, but it has these four different chains and they're proteins. They're made up of amino acids. They're encoded by your DNA and they're kind of like the backbone of it. Now on the protein are these heme groups and notice the heme has red. So heme is a red pigment and there are four. So we have four hemes for each hemoglobin. Now, in the center of the heme is an iron, and it's the iron that binds the oxygen. So what happens is we can have one oxygen on each heme. So that means that one hemoglobin can transport four oxygens. Now, you don't have to give me the numbers, but I just want you to get a sense of this. So if one red blood cell has 250 million, I'll just write this way instead of all the zeros, million hemoglobins, and one hemoglobin can carry four oxygens. If we multiply, we get one billion. So one red blood cell can transport one billion oxygens, right? oxygen molecules, O2s. And we just said cubic millimeter blood has five million red blood cells, and we have five liters of blood. So you, it's astounding. Okay, so we have an incredible capacity to transport. So when we look at hemoglobin, we need to know how we measure hemoglobin, because that's important too, right? That's what actually is binding the, the um, iron and the oxygen. So hemoglobin is measured not as a percent, but it's called grams per 100 ml of blood. So we usually say grams per deciliter is actually how they do it. So we would look at 12 to 18 grams per deciliter is going to be the um, way we measure hemoglobin. Now women are going to be closer to 12, so maybe 12 to 15, and males will be on the higher end, maybe 15 to 18, and again that's due to testosterone. So the functions of the hemoglobin, they're going to transport oxygen, but they also, it also transports CO2. So red blood cells can transport both O2 and CO2 at the same time. And they do have a different color. We talked about the coloring of blood when we started this lecture. So whenever a red blood cell and whenever hemoglobin is attached to oxygen, we call it oxyhemoglobin. And so we would say this is, actually I'm gonna use this color. So we say it's O2 rich blood, okay, it's oxygenated and it looks like a brighter red color. And in fact, on all the anatomical models, if you look at a blood vessel and it's red, it's colored red to show you that there's O2 rich blood in there. Now, if it doesn't have, if it's not full, if it's not saturated with four of those oxygens per heme, we call it reduced or deoxyhemoglobin and we write it as HHB. So we would say this is O2 poor blood. It's never without oxygen. It usually has maybe two O2 molecules but it's considered O2 poor, and that's what you probably see if you bleed, because that's venous blood, which looks darker red or even like a purplish color. The reason our veins look blue is just the scattering of light as it reflects through our skin by the time it reaches our eyeballs. Now, CO2 is also transported on hemoglobin, and this is called, big word of the day, you'll always win hangman with this word, carbaminohemoglobin. Notice that's written HbCO2, and that's when the carbon dioxide is transported. Now the heme, right, the heme is going to transport the oxygen. It's the globin, it's the protein that transports the CO2. So they're actually carried on different parts of the molecule. So the little heme disc are responsible for the O2 transport, but this backbone in this picture is this blue and purple, that's the globin. The globin is going to transport the CO2. And interestingly enough, carbon monoxide, CO, you probably know that as a, a very bad <laughs> gas to breathe in. And we'll talk more about that in the respiratory system. Um, it's from like car exhaust, cigarette smoke, uh, burning of fossil fuels. So carboxyhemoglobin is when hemoglobin binds to carbon monoxide because it can bind to that as well.
Now, one thing that's kind of interesting is that the red blood cells can release what's called NO, which is nitric oxide. And so nitric oxide is a vasodilator. And in AMP1, you learned about like intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms of homeostasis. And intrinsic is when like the cell or the tissue did it themselves. Well, this is really cool about blood. So first of all, we've talked about vasodilation, but what happens is you have your blood vessel and blood vessels have smooth muscle. Well, when that vasodilates, notice it gets bigger and you see a better picture here. Well, why do we want to vasodilate? Because more blood can flow through it. And when more blood flows through, that's going to allow you to better get oxygen and nutrients to all those cells. So when we're looking at red blood cells, you know, their main job is to transport oxygen. So if I come back here for a minute, if we look at a red blood cell and oxygen, 98.5% of all oxygen in your body is transported on hemoglobin. That's considerable, right? You really need to have the oxygen. If we look at how much of the CO2 is transported, maybe 20%. CO2 has other mechanisms of transport, so it's not dependent on those red blood cells as much. And so if there's an area that has any kind of hypoxia, and hypoxia just means it's not getting enough oxygen, the red blood cell senses this, and the red blood cell releases nitric oxide to open up the vessel, to vasodilate. So it's pretty neat how the red blood cell can sense that, increase the size of the vessel, vasodilate, to get more blood to the area and fix the hypoxia. And one thing they know is that this happens with like fresher blood. So when they were first um, figuring this out, they would give blood transfusions. People might have cardiac arrest and... Um, a lot of people were dying and then they realized that blood has an expiration date. And so now when you donate blood, they only store it so long and it does seem to be like the fresher blood is better at doing this. And then I just want to mention fetal hemoglobin really quick. So obviously fetuses have blood, they have hemoglobin as well. It's a little different though. You don't have to memorize when it peaks and when it declines, but this fetal hemoglobin, this is a, a curve, this is a graph. And what this graph is trying to show you is how saturated the hemoglobin is with oxygen in response to the O2 pressure. And the bigger thing to see from this is that the mom's hemoglobin is down here and that the fetal hemoglobin is shown <clears throat> in red. So what you should get from this graph is that, notice at any given O2, fetal hemoglobin, the line's higher. Well, what does that mean if it's higher? It means that it has more oxygen on it. So what we say is that fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen. Affinity is how much it likes it. So fetal hemoglobin can grab oxygen um, it will it has a higher affinity for it than mom's. This is very, very important because when mom's blood flows by to exchange with the fetus cells, the fetus is able to steal that oxygen from mom. So if not, we wouldn't have babies because the fetus would not be able to get oxygen from mom. So it's a very important um, trait of this hemoglobin. And because it has such a high affinity, they actually have some medication to try to help produce more fetal hemoglobin or mimic fetal hemoglobin. It's used in actually cancer treatment as well, but it is one treatment for sickle cell disease. So sickle cell, you learned about in Bio 119, the red blood cell, it's a genetic um, disease with one base is off. So the red cell changes its shape. Remember these are actually really easy to like bend and squeeze through capillaries. The sickle cell cannot. So if you go in a sickle cell crisis, it's extremely painful. Um, and it, it interferes with your ability to deliver oxygen. So this is just one treatment because it can kind of make those red cells mimic the um, fetal hemoglobin. So it helps the patient's body hold on to oxygen better. So when we're going to look at the formation of red cells, okay, we have to talk about formation and destruction. We know that it's called, the whole production of blood is called hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis. It happens from stem cells, which are in your red bone marrow. And so the stem cells are called hemopoietic stem cells. You should just recognize that because what that means is that these are stem cells. They can differentiate to become any formed element. 
Just notice they have different pathways, different lineages to form all of the blood cells. So they all come from a single one. We are going to focus on erythropoiesis, which is specifically the production of red blood cells. So we still start with our hemocytoblast, our, our hemopoietic stem cell. Same thing. We're not going to memorize the lineage. We just note that it changes. Notice it has a nucleus. It has to have a nucleus because remember the nucleus has the DNA and hemoglobin is made up of globin, which is a protein. So if you don't have DNA, you're not making that protein. So the early form, it's pumping out, it's just making hemoglobin, making hemoglobin. And as the hemoglobin starts to take over the cell, there's less room. And so the nucleus pops out and then it's released to circulate. So the cell starts to differentiate and just starts to really produce all that hemoglobin. Remember, no mitochondria can only do glycolysis. And then what's released is the erythrocyte. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll notice this precursor cell here is called a reticulocyte. So reticulocyte is actually typically released from the bone marrow. So you can measure these in your blood as well. They mature to become the erythrocyte. So think of them as a precursor, immediate precursor to the erythrocyte. And so if you're trying to find out how well your bone marrow is making the red cells, you do a reticulocyte count because those are the, the baby cells, right? Those are the precursors to the red blood cell. Now I put a picture here, you don't have to identify them, um, but that's the immediate precursor. And it lets you know, is the bone marrow working? Is it making it? So the production of red cells is called erythropoiesis, and it's basically, it's negative feedback, which is what a lot of cells and tissues use in our body. And the stimulus for negative feedback is going to be hypoxia. So there's some sort of low oxygen level in your body. And interesting enough, the receptors are in your kidney. So your kidneys are gonna detect this low oxygen level. And when the receptors detect it, the kidney's the control center it releases the hormone called EPO. Now EPO is known as erythropoietin, but we always just say and write EPO. Now when EPO, the little blue triangles gets released, it's gonna go to your red bone marrow. And when it gets there, it's gonna say, hey, I need you to make more red cells. So therefore you're going to increase the production of red blood cells. You're going to raise your hematocrit. Those red cells are gonna grab more oxygen from your lungs and get it back to the tissue. So it's a negative feedback. Blood oxygen levels fall or tissue oxygen levels fall. Somewhere there's hypoxia. The receptor detects it, releases the hormone EPO. It goes to your red bone marrow and it increases your red cells. So now you're no longer hypoxic. And that's how it, how it works. Now, in order to make a red blood cell, you got to eat well. You have to make sure you're eating enough carbohydrate and fat because you really want to use the protein to make the hemoglobin. You don't want to be burning protein for energy. We know we need a bunch of B vitamins. We need folic acid and we need B12 and something called intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is produced by the stomach. And vitamin B12 is a pretty big vitamin, you might know that. And so um, usually it has to bind to intrinsic factor for absorption. So you need that to absorb B12. That's why a lot of times B12 is given as an injection. So blood doping, we alluded to this earlier. Why would you wanna dope your blood? Well, what does that mean? It means that you're artificially increasing your hematocrit. So you can see your normal hematocrit here and here's your doped blood here. Why would you do that? Because we know that red blood cells are the main way we're getting oxygen to our tissues and our muscles. And we know that if you can work aerobically, longer and faster, you, you can go longer, right? You're gonna win the race because once you go at a certain speed, like maybe it's running or biking, and once you're at that speed and you go anaerobically, you're going to make lactate and it hurts and you stop. But what if you could go at that speed aerobically, then you could do it a lot longer. So it is abused often. So what people or athletes have done is they find someone who gives them EPO, um, and they take the EPO and they dope their blood. Um, there have been cases where the athletes have actually re <laughs> removed blood, stored it, and they reinfused it before the event. Well, that's pretty scary, right? Because it's not, you know, super structured there. And there's athletes who have died um, because remember that when you dope your blood and you have more red cells, it's more viscous. Now imagine instead of like a watery type fluid, it's more like a syrup 
it's not going to get to your heart and your brain. So you're going to have a heart attack or a stroke. And it has happened. There was a whole Danish cycling team. I think almost the entire team died from blood doping. Now, the natural way to do it is to go up to Denver, Colorado, go up in altitude, because when you go up in altitude, your body is hypoxic, right? Because you're up in altitude, there's the part, the amount of oxygen that is, um, for right now, we're just going to say that there's less oxygen in the air. That's not entirely true. I'll give you the truth in respiratory, but that's okay to think that way right now. So you have less oxygen availability, so you're more hypoxic, and then you start to make EPO, and you do. You, your hematocrit goes up. People who live at higher altitudes have higher hematocrits, and that's a more natural way, and you're not going to die from it because your body's going to um, monitor it. Now, we make them. They live for three to four months, and then they die, and we've got a a lot of these, right? Billions and billions of these trillions of red cells. So we don't just want them dying in our blood vessels. We got to get rid of them. So they have to be broken down. And when a red cell is lysed, it's called hemolysis. So it's phagocytized. Macrophages in your liver and spleen and red bone marrow are going to do this. Most of it happens in the spleen. Um, a lot of it happens in the spleen. Some of it happens in the liver. Some of it, they die in the bloodstream. So sometimes they're just so old and fragile and they just can't make it to the spleen or the liver. And so they actually hemolyze in your bloodstream. Well, that means they separate out. And then the hemoglobin has to be excreted by your kidneys. So the hemoglobin goes to the kidneys and you pee it out in your urine. And if you have a lot of this, you have hemoglobinuria. So that's how we would know if we had a low hematocrit because our red cells were being lysed, right? They're dying in circulation. So what happens is we said we had this whole hemoglobin molecule, right? And we said that hemoglobin was made up of those protein strands. And then we had the heme, the red thing, and we had the iron. So the globin is just protein. It's just recycled. It gets broken down to amino acids and reused. It's pretty easy. The heme's the problem. The heme is that red group. The iron gets removed, and the iron goes back to your bone marrow by transferrin. Remember, that was one of the transport proteins we learned? So that's going to be recycled. But we have to deal with the heme, which is what causes all the trouble. So the heme goes through some conversions. It gets converted to something called biliverdin, which has a greenish color. And then biliverdin is broken down to bilirubin, which has a yellow color. And then bilirubin is supposed to be, uh, this may, by the way, most of this happens in your liver. And so the liver, right, is going to excrete bilirubin into bile, and then bile enters your small intestine, and then it goes in your large intestine, and then you eliminate it in your feces. And they're called stercobilins in the feces by the time they get there, and they have a brown color. Some of the um, bilirubin gets converted to urobilin, and that's going to be excreted in your urine. It has a yellow color. That's why urine is yellow. And so this whole process is very, very important because bilirubin is a waste product. And if your liver isn't working properly and bilirubin can't be excreted, it accumulates in your fatty tissue. So it likes to accumulate under your skin and in the whites of your eyes. And you have what's called jaundice. You have a yellowing tint to it because of that bilirubin. And so you have this picture where you can kind of see it a little better. You can see the giant macrophage here. I have my red blood cells. Some of them get lysed in the blood, right, hemolysis, and they just get excreted in the kidneys, 10% is normal. If it's higher, then that's a problem. So it goes in, the macrophage, whether it's in the spleen or the liver, is going to break it down. And so it's going to take the globin and recycle the amino acids. It's going to take the heme and pull the iron off and transport it back to the red bone marrow. The heme gets converted to biliverdin and bilirubin primarily is going to happen in the liver, which will leave out through the bile. So one way to remember the coloring of this is it goes from biliverdin to bilirubin is if you've ever had a bruise before. A bruise is a broken blood vessel. It's bleeding under your skin. And so when you get a bruise, the first thing is it kind of looks like a purplish or a, or a blue color, right? That's the blood that you're seeing pooling underneath your skin. It's that purplish, you know, that's what we said the color of um, low O2 poor blood is, right? Deoxygenated blood. And then if you watch it, it turns kind of greenish. That's the biliverdin. So that's when the heme is just, it's just degrading under your skin.
and you can see it turning into the green and then it turns yellow and that's Billy Rubin and so you know, I'm not saying to punch yourself and give yourself a bruise, but if you follow a bruise, you can kind of see what's happening to it and you can kind of, you can see that process happening before your very eyes. So this concludes our Ed Puzzle on the red blood cell.